The following is me doing my Dragoon opener. As you can see, my way of playing is probably vastly different to yours. My UI likely also looks entirely different. But ultimately, the important part is that I can see what I am doing, and I am able to use it to its maximum effect. I have been playing this game since the tail end of A Realm Reborn, like this. Even playing like this in single digit FPS situations. I was on a laptop. I have largely kept my Dragoon hotbars unchanged through the years, doing minor tweaks at best with the changes. Since my layout has seemingly withstood the test of time for my playstyle, I figured it would be best if I gave out tips on how you might set up your UI, controls, or other settings. Essentially, a sequel to the video on screen, with a link in the description and a card in the corner linking to it. That video was all about me and my setup for the most part. It also remains essentially completely applicable, with very little changes since then. This video will focus on helping you improve your settings. We're gonna go through basically every single possible setting in this video, so that explains the length I hope. If it doesn't, well maybe you need to watch, because anyone who knows what settings they are, knows the length matches. Also note that this is being done on the PC client version of the game. I do not know what specific options the PS4 and 5 have, but I am on PC, and over time they will add more options as the game continues. If there's something in the options I've not gone over, it's probably new. Before we get into it though, please rate, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Support is appreciated. This is a big one, and I hope it's equally helpful. Alright, rule one for making your setup better. As the YouTube video maker, I am the only correct person. You must copy my setup exactly, and if you don't, you are playing the game wrong. Wait, that's just what weird YouTube comments say. Rule 1, there is no wrong way to play, with an important asterisk. There is always intentionally not using your whole toolkit as such, ways that are just blatantly wrong. But when it comes to layout and control scheme, there is no outright wrong way to play if it works for you. There will be ways that just don't work for your playstyle and wrong for you, but it isn't inherently a bad playstyle. I'm going to recommend what you should or should not do with certain settings. I'm going to also jokingly judge you for some choices here or there, but it is important to remember that if you are making it work for you without issue, it's not a bad way to do things. There's also always trying to make your layout ergonomic and better for your hands, like using keys around WASD, or maybe one of those MMO mice. There's a lot of different options there for you. Experiment with different things and see what works for you. Just make sure you give it a chance and not just five minutes. Given I hated gyro controls in Splatoon 2 but can play with them in Splatoon 3, says a lot about how exposure is half the battle. So you could copy me with 1 to equals, shift 1 to equals, and function keys, or do anything else that fits you. We'll do that in the keybinds menu. You can assign every individual hotbar slot with a different key if you'd like, or modify your combos with shift and control and such. You can even combine modifier combos, though that goes for all keybinds. Make sure while you're here you check the duty actions at the bottom. Have those for Stormblood and later if you're still progressing. You'll need those in main story duties. Controller players usually have one button layout they can deal with, though you can swap button functions, which comes down to putting your skills in better spaces on your crossbars. Keyboard players have near infinite button layouts they can try with how many more possible keys they can press. But strangely, you can entirely recreate a PS4 controller on the keyboard. The gamepad tab allows for this. I myself have a PS4 controller plugged in at all times, but as someone who may not have one, you can access the PS4 controller and the crossbar system. Here you can see me messing with my crossbars. This is actually me hitting H for R1, and G and F for left and right D-pad. While we're here, let's continue to look over all of the keybinds menu. Working backwards, we have the system menu. This holds basically everything that doesn't fall into a specific category, and then some. Confirm, cancel. Weirdly, hotbar cycling is in this menu. 
Cycling applies to hotbar 1, swapping that hotbar to have the same keybinds and abilities of one of your other hotbars. That's also what those arrows do, and I'll be showing you how to turn those off like I did. Because oh boy do we want those off. But if you have a use for hotbar cycling, this is where you might apply those keys. You can even specifically key in swaps to every individual hotbar at the bottom. Other notable things are mostly weird namings of things. Target main menu means the menu buttons I have in the top right corner. This is the main menu, even though you might consider that the title screen. Toggle UI display mode is more easily named Toggle UI. Hitting this button will entirely turn off the UI for cleaner screenshots. Cycle through HUD components is stuff that is currently visible on your HUD, but not like all the buttons? Not sure of the purpose myself. Target filter swaps your filtering mode in a very useful way, provided you don't mess with the settings we'll talk about later. It basically makes all non-NPCs ignored by mouse clicks. So say you're doing a new story quest and the NPC is crowded by 20 players, hold X and click the NPC with no issues. Or change it off of X. Your call. Log window zoom means the chat box. This keybind will basically full screen the chat box. Overkill unless you're trying to catch up on chats you missed. Mouse sonar may be extremely useful for people who constantly lose track of their mouse, if a bit flashy overkill. As you can see, it flashes a giant circle where your mouse cursor is that then closes in on it. I'm not a fan of how bright the flash is, but it might be good for you. Toggle color filtering settings is colorblind mode, which we'll go over later too. It toggles it on and off. General duty key should be called the level sync button. Fates all in the overworld make you level sync when you outlevel them. This is your way to simply keybind it. Scenario guide keys are for the scenario guide in the top left, if unmoved. This will show you on the map right where to find your next main scenario quest is, or the special side quest, usually job quests, when available. You could also just click them, similarly to display subcommands back at the top. That just means the right click function. The rest of the system buttons are essentially all self explanatory, I would say. Yeah, I'm actually trying to give you some benefit of the doubt and to not make this video three hours long. But if there's something I do skip that you want answered, ask in the comments or check for a pinned comment. Other stuff will be gone over later when appropriate. Chat tab has all the chat based commands and actions. Readying the log means to begin typing in it. As long as you have direct chat off, which keep direct chat off unless you're a controller player if you want to keep sane, those are your main ways of typing in chat. Reply temporarily is for quick replying to people who send slash tells, or whispers, to you. It will automatically change your chat channel to a reply to that person for the duration of that text input. You can even hit it up to 15 times to reply to any of the last 15 people who have messaged you. Why 15? Who knows. It will cycle back to the first person after the 15th in line. Sorry I can't show this, but I tried to make it a point to avoid naming and shaming, even if I am not shaming any of the people in my tells. Try it for yourself in the meantime. Maybe get a friend to be a demo. All the other temporarily switch options are the exact same, just with every other chat option. Starting from reply forward and back, again then forward and back, the options are changing to a semi-permanent default swap to that chat channel. You can keep swapping channels as much as you want, including with the slash commands, but your chat will default to this channel until you log off or change the default again. The shortcuts tab is where just about every single menu shortcut is. If there is a menu, there is probably a shortcut to it in here. Why isn't the shortcut to HUD layout in here? Because it's technically not a menu, it's a mode. The only one I'll mention though is that there is an alarm menu. Check it out. Targeting is all about, well, targeting things. These are all obvious in their use just about, aside from maybe focus target. Focus target puts a special arrow over said target and will dedicate an entire UI element to them. This is for keeping track of any extra target. Maybe you want to better watch a specific tank in a duty, or there's two boss targets and you want to be able to see both HP bars at once. If you don't want to just right click the player or target, these keys will let you select our focus target and swap them as needed. Targeting modes is a deeper topic that involves character configuration. 
We'll go through it all there, and I'll call back to keybinds for these existing. Otherwise, the rest of this is self-explanatory as you play the game. Movement is probably the most important of all these menus aside from hotbar, and is where other settings will be very, very important. Steer means you will walk forward, and your camera controls your turning and what forward is. This is true regardless of what your other settings are. Move forward and back, and then forward and back, and then go forward and back, are obvious. Almost. Moving back can be walking backwards. Moving left and right can be turning left and right. Strafing is luckily consistent. These will depend on your movement mode, so we'll come back to these with that discussion. The next notable keybind is the locking camera. This is just awful. The lock-on is genuinely a punishment and has no real benefits. You can't even walk into the target, and some attacks hit everywhere except the target circle. You literally are at a disadvantage to use it. Turn it off now. Flip camera will flip the camera to look behind you for as long as you hold the button. This does not change which direction is forward though. It is purely for quick checking behind you while you run, which auto run can also do. Face camera is a bit of a misnomer. What it means is your character will turn their head to face the camera, so long as it isn't right behind them and would require them to be an owl. Idling camera is a less boring way of going AFK, away from keyboard. The idle camera will remove all UI and randomly follow any and all targetable objects, and sometimes just randomly point into the sky. It's more a dynamic AFK, kind of like a screensaver. You could also just use the auto translation to use slash idling camera. No point in having a keybind for it. Same for the slash G pose function. Just type it, no real point in a keybind for it. It's a picture mode. Unless you're trying to capture very specific action shots, a keybind isn't going to help. These two also weren't movement, but okay. But that covers the main majority of keybinds that are extra notable or confusing to understand. But a couple of those relate to other settings, so we should get right into covering those. I'm going to start with system settings since a lot of this gets technical and probably not worth going deep into beyond saying it improves graphics versus performance. Display settings are the settings that are most important. Main display is what screen your game will hook onto when you boot it up. I have two monitors, so both are options. Screen mode is self-explanatory mostly. Windowed mode you probably won't use without doing some massive multitasking. Trying to do Island Sanctuary spreadsheets without needing to alt-tab or such. Typically, borderless windowed is the best call, as this will full screen the game without actually full screening it. Alt-tabbing and borderless won't cause that weird hitching that happens with full screen games. It comes without the benefits of full screen though, that is, being able to adjust your resolution. Borderless windowed will always match the resolution and refresh rate of the monitor. Full screen actually lets you adjust those. Resolution is basically the size of the game in a way? How many pixels will be put on screen, both in terms of height and width? The bigger your resolution, the more you can see. The 60HZ, 85HZ, etc. is the refresh rate you're running at, or what the max frame rate you're running at is. 60Hz is 60 frames per second, or how many times the game is drawn on screen per second. The higher your FPS, the more smooth the game will run. Prioritize a smooth frame rate over pure numbers though. The ideal minimum is a smooth 60 FPS, but you'll be constantly seeing my frame rate hovering at 144 since this monitor is 144Hz. High resolution UI settings and default UI size are things you want to touch only before you start messing with your UI. All UI can be scaled to as small as 60% of their base size to 200% of their base size. High resolution UI settings is for making your UI bigger as a default. 100% size, base size, will be increased by whichever modifier you use. So the WQHD option will double the size of all UI elements before the 60% to 200% scaling is applied. If you start playing and everything is too small, start here. Default size is that 60% to 200% scaling I mentioned. Changing default size will change what all new UI elements will start at. Instead of starting at a normal size, you might want all defaults to be super huge to get in your way so you know this is new. Figure out how you want it. And apply all applies that value to all UI elements. Again, do not touch this unless you are ready to go on a massive UI adjustment binge. 
Gamma correction is something basically every game makes you do these days. Adjust how bright the game is versus your screen brightness. If the game is too dark for you, up the gamma to see a little better. Unique to here though is character lighting. Just want to be able to see a character, or any character, better? Up the character brightness. And finally we have a second frame rate setting. This is your FPS cap. There's varying opinions on why you should or shouldn't cap your FPS. I cap mine to 144 for stability and saving my PC the effort. Others will argue you should leave your FPS uncapped unless you see screen tearing, which if you don't even know what that means, just says you might not even notice it. Personally, I would say cap it at whatever your refresh rate is. So for me, that is the 144 I'll always have. There isn't really any reason to cap it lower than that, unless your system is really struggling. Back in the day, my laptop would drop to as low as single digits as I mentioned. So I capped my frame rate to 30 FPS at a one half refresh rate on 60 Hertz. In ideal situations, I could actually get that high, but rarely. One fourth and a 15 FPS lock would have been more consistent. Limiting FPS when AFK or when the game is not in focus is for saving your PC the energy of rendering the game fully when you aren't actively playing. Again, something for helping your PC run better even a little. Alt tabbing to change music? There you go. Next button. Sound settings doesn't have a lot to go over. Play music when mounted will turn on or off mount music. If you're getting into a new expansion, it's recommended to turn this off so you can hear the new zone themes. Similarly for keeping on normal battle music. New expansions have new battle tracks. If you have it off, you won't be getting battle music. Enabling city-state BGM in residential areas will change the music of each housing area to the city they are associated with instead of the normal housing music. There's a basic housing track, but if you prefer the city theme, just leave and come back and the music will switch over, or enter a house and exit. Play system sounds while waiting for Duty Finder is for when your duty pops. There's a ticking that occurs every second, but only if you have this on. That way, if you miss the chime, there is still a sound popping at you. Listening position is where your sound is coming from, so to say. The lower the number, the closer it will be to your camera's position than your character. Sounds further away from your camera's position will be quieter, while those closer to your camera will be louder, or vice versa depending on how you set it. Do you want to hear what your character would hear most, or a more surrounding area soundscape? The volume sliders are basically all self-explanatory, but I will say that ambient sounds just cover stuff like crickets chirping or the wind blowing. And performance is the special bard action of playing instruments. If some guy is failing to play Darude Sandstorm in the Aetherite Plaza, you can mute them quickly here or with the keybind for it. Performance also has its own settings for keybinds and octaves and stuff. Pretty self-explanatory stuff in there. Well, if you know music. I don't! Further down we also have the DualShock settings. These controllers come with built-in speakers that you can have sounds come out of. This could be a second way to make sure you're hearing the Duty Finder sounds. I keep it off though. Equalizer is basically... Do you know those memes that like, explode your ears because their volumes go super loud and distorted? Usually those are bass boosted, to an extreme degree. These will be a more reasonable EQ setting. Unless you're an audiophile, you probably have no use for this. Or maybe there's some tone deafness you're working with. And if you are, well, you probably already know what EQ is. And spatial audio, uh, it's 360 degree audio. I'll leave it at Square's explanation for it. Just click the link if you want more info. Graphic settings are next and for the most part are no different to your normal game settings. However, we have UI resolution settings. This will make the UI look crisper and more detailed. Some icons and such have a significant difference when you turn this on. Others, I can't see a difference at all. 
Your mileage may vary, but this is a definite thing to turn on if your system isn't struggling. This does not change the size, only the quality. Dynamic resolution does as it says and will adjust resolution as needed for performance. But I've never touched it and it says it's in beta at the moment, so uh, yeah. Some of the next stuff gets pretty technical and weird sounding. Wet surface effects is obvious, but also seems to have a big effect on lighting too. Occlusion calling might still be obvious. For some reason, it works in reverse. When off, all objects you cannot see will all be rendered, made visible and active by the game, regardless of your camera and placement in a map. Disabling it will make the game render less stuff at once, only doing so when visible. Disabling will improve performance by a lot. From here I'm going to give you very minor descriptions of these settings, but just keep the following in mind. Turning something on, or turning it up or down, will affect performance. LOD is as it sounds at least. If an object is far away, it will have a less detailed model for performance. The high detail version will replace it when you get close. Real-time reflections is a bit jargony sounding, but just assume all reflections from mirrors and anything shiny fall under this. Anti-aliasing is probably something you are very familiar with if you ever tinkered with game options, but as it says, it just smooths jagged edges on objects, though it can be very hard to see. Most things I checked, I saw no difference. Wooden objects, though, seem to all have a noticeable difference. Transparent lighting is about water. It will shimmer and ripple differently and more smoothly. If you see performance issues around water, turn this off. Grass quality is not about Snoop Dogg. Parallax occlusion is basically texture depth to put it as simple as possible. An object will look less flat. Like, imagine the surface of a rock. It probably doesn't feel perfectly smooth, even if it is flat. Tessellation is similar, but is for the model itself. The higher it is, the more quality a model tends to be. Glare is like when you are staring into the sun. Okay, no, um... Oh, it means... This water reflection. And nothing else you would expect to be glare. That all applies to an effect further down, also called glare. Shadow LOD is the same as normal LOD, but for any shadows in the distance. Can be a lot harder to tell depending on what you're looking at. Shadow resolution is shadow quality. How much detail you will be able to see in any shadow. Shadow cascading basically will make shadows only appear close by. Far away shadows will just not exist, and only fade in as you move in. Shadow softening is where a shadow will seem blurrier at the edges, just because shadows tend not to be hard-edged, they soften until they disappear. Texture filtering is essentially texture smoothing. The higher you put it, the smoother it will be for a very little performance hit. Anostrophic is the highest, and can be made to be 4x, 8x, or 16x filtering. Not all textures will have a noticeable difference. Movement physics are very subtle and hard to notice. This is basically how clothing moves on a player when running or in the wind. Here's a side by side of my shirt. Limb darkening is very subtle as well, unless you start to mess with it. It gives a bit more of a cinematic look. I go back and forth on if I like it or not. Just watch the edges of the screen though. Being off apparently will help performance. Radial blur you can probably safely keep on unless you have big problems with things ever being blurry for any way. Screen space ambient occlusion is the type of ambient occlusion you're using. That being, say, determining how exposed each part of an object is exposed to light. You can see how it affects the decorations around me and even the grass a little bit. Glare here actually means the glare you probably think of. Water refraction is how light is deflected by water rather than passing through in the same direction. It makes underwater environments look a lot wavier and distorted when on. And finally, depth of field. In cutscenes. Basically, depth of field blurs anything in the background when that is not part of a scene's focus. Mouse settings is our next button and is a very small section. Allowing for resolution changes with mouse drag is only applicable to the windowed mode. You can click and drag the window edges to change the size of it and the resolution. And limiting the mouse to always be stuck in game is always useful. 
Mouse camera sensitivity is how fast the camera will spin for mouse usage. As you can see, zero makes it near impossible to turn. Expanded mouse functionality is weird to say, but it's useful. You can increase your mouse cursor size under the hardware cursor FFXIV custom or software cursor. OS standard is your normal desktop cursor and is probably super tiny? Take some time to feel out hardware versus software cursor, but hardware feels way smoother to me and is the one that can become huge for anyone who has a 4K monitor. Next we have gamepad settings. If you don't have a controller, skip ahead. They let you pick your specific controller and even your button map. You can have Xbox buttons and an Xbox button map, despite this not being on Xbox yet. They just realize that a lot of players have Xbox controllers for PC play. Most of this is normal controller stuff. Window zoom via R3 click actually means UI scaling like we covered before. Cycling through 60% to 200% in increasing size. Text pasting I believe is only possible on PC, but still requires text copying first. Virtual mouse when on will be L1 plus R3 click. It will give you, well, a virtual mouse to click around on the screen, instead of everything acting like a menu list. Calibration is for if your controller seems to not be working, like sticks drifting. And button config? This is your keybind menu, essentially. Theme settings is purely visual and based on preference. As you can tell, I've swapped over to clear blue, but we have dark, the default, light, classic Final Fantasy, and clear blue. They may add more in future, too. Other settings is, well, everything else. Screenshot settings, AFK timer... Notable is the character and object limits. If you have issues with crowded areas, turn this down. The language settings is also specific. You can change what language your game runs in with cutscene audio. If you want to hear characters speaking in Japanese or German or French, here you go. Finally, remember that color filtering keybind? That is to turn on colorblind mode, found in the accessibility tab. There are three options and a slider to adjust how strong the filter is. If you have colorblindness and this isn't enough for you, be sure to tell the devs on the forums. They can't fix it without more feedback. Also here is a deafness mode. Visual alerts will be placed on the sides of the screen. Doing actions and hearing enemy actions, you will see the sound waves bounce around. Any mechanics that rely on sound, you can play with this. And that's the system config. It's a lot of stuff to play with and just normal settings. But that means it's time for the big one, the spot with the most options, character configuration. This is where you will probably continually go back to most often while tinkering with stuff. In the top left we have a mode swap between mouse mode and gamepad mode. Both are accessible regardless of the mode, but gamepad mode is much more controller friendly, with added tooltips for which buttons do what. I will stay in mouse mode. In our first menu, the control settings menu, we start off with the most important setting I could look at. Legacy versus standard controls. Standard is character based for what forward and back and then forward and back are. If you turn the camera by itself and then walk forward, your character will continue to go in whatever direction they are facing. The giant drawback of this mode is walking backwards. Try it. You won't move backwards. You'll very slowly inch with a back pedal. Why is this a problem? Well, consider any AoE. But let's say a boss-centered AoE. You need to dodge it. Facing the enemy, what is the quickest path out of this AoE? Straight behind you. Personally, I will forever and ever suggest the option of a Legacy, the camera-based mode. Your character will be piloted based on wherever your camera is facing. Left is left, right is right, Forward and back, and then forward and back, are straight forward and straight backward, then put one foot forward. Running backward will run you at the camera, without slowing down. This is where maintain camera distance comes in. As you run toward your camera, it will stay still and your character will get closer. Maintain camera distance ensures your camera does not automatically get closer as you approach. It will stay whatever distance away you set it at. On top of this, I suggest an additional measure. You have two options. Personally, I go with option one. Remove turn left and right and make A and D be strafe left and right. This will allow you to move in linear eight directional movement without the camera slowly turning as you do. Again, straight lines tend to be the best way to dodge mechanics. 
This has the penalty slash benefit of using strafe plus run backwards will give you the same backpedal from standard settings. I call this a benefit since... When the hell am I going to run backwards and strafe at the same time? It's an odd angle with very little use case, while I can just spin the mouse a little if such an angle is needed. If this is still a bad idea to you, use option 2. You can turn on disable camera pivot and keep turn left and right on your A and D. Disable camera pivot will do as it says. Disable the small spin the camera does during turning. It essentially makes it a different way to strafe, without giving you the back pedal on running backwards and to the sides. They do feel slightly different, and controller players do have some slight differences between all of this, but for the most part, it applies across both settings. Tinker around with what works best for you, I'll just loudly silently judge you for it. Finally, in Legacy there's one last option that seemingly is only for controllers as I can't find any difference on keyboard. Activate standard type auto fly slash auto dive allows you to hit the auto run button, L1, and be able to rotate the camera without changing your altitude when the setting is off. While on, changing your camera facing during auto run will change which direction you fly. Flying mount takeoff is a lot simpler of a setting meanwhile. Choose how many presses of the jump button do you need to start flying. If you like to be able to jump around like an idiot while mounted, but have flight unlocked in an area, go to double jump. Otherwise, quickly flying is best done with auto. Direct chat is Satan for anyone but a peer controller user. Direct chat makes basically any key press, even those bound with actions, go into the chat box. Any accidental press will get you typing in chat and likely spamming it too. Even controller players probably often have this off, so they don't accidentally have their pets start typing. Can't do anything if they step on enter first, but still better than always possible. Cutscene skipping does exactly as it says. Skipping playback of previously viewed scenario cutscenes means duty cutscenes. Tired of watching the same intro cutscene of the dungeon you were farming? This auto skips it. Transportation cutscenes means any kind of boat scene that plays when using it to travel to another destination. And housing cutscenes? I'm not even sure what cutscenes there are to skip. If you can even get a house. Camera controls contains a section all on reversing axis of turning. You're a warrior of light, not an airplane. Who turns these on? Auto adjustment is that snap of the camera to right behind you. Standard controls have this as a default effect of playing with it, but has its own unique setting to turn it off. For us on Legacy, we only have this for first person camera. Try turning the camera with a left click on each of the settings, then walk forward. And obviously, Y-axis auto-adjust also makes the camera snap to in front of you if you say, look down. Switching to first person when zoomed in is only useful to me if you never try zooming a camera close to your character. If you ever want to zoom in for pictures or such, you're better off leaving this off. The first person keybind is enough, and first person serves no normal gameplay purpose. Enable camera effects is screen shaking on actions. It's only certain actions that cause a screen shake. For example, Holy does it, but Holy 3 does not. I even wasn't sure what this setting did because there was no effect on Holy 3. That's why I'm in Zamail Darkhold. These bars are mostly speed. Camera stick speed is how fast your right control stick will turn the camera. Keyboard means the arrow keys, or whatever you change the keybinds to and character turn speed only applies to standard controls. Turn left and right will be faster the higher you have this set. Third person camera angle is the thing I just adjust with control plus arrow keys. As you can see, I'm not using the mouse to do it, but it adjusts your camera angle for seeing more in front or behind you. I tend to keep the camera pretty high angled, since in front is most important, and I can quickly swivel to see behind me, or that keybind for seeing behind you. Finally is the event camera settings. It adds a small cinematic pan to the camera to better look at certain NPCs when talking to them. It's a nice addition, but hardly required. But that's just the first tab. We have four to go, just for general. Let's move on to target settings. Automatically lock on target when initiating auto attack does exactly as it says. I still highly advise against it due to the issues it causes. 
face target when using actions is equally important to keep on. You cannot use any action that requires a target without facing them first. Turning this off means you will need to do extra micromanaging of your movement to keep facing an enemy. There's a very tiny downside to this for when you're not facing an enemy and trying to run away without stopping your attack. There's a very, very tiny stutter, and if you mash the key while out of range and your GCD isn't rolling, you'll see a lot more stutter. But you're not able to hit anyway, so stop mashing. Otherwise, I recommend this to be on for all Legacy players. For standard players, you may need to play with other settings, like the auto camera turns to make this work. Disable targeting of pets and minions when in battle is at minimum very nice in the overworld. There are no reasons to ever target a pet or a minion, with all actions done via pet hotbar or normal skill presses. Unless you're hoping to pet Carby in the middle of some ultimate attack downtime, just keep it on. Switch target circle to target select is basically to turn off the soft targeting system of the game. Controllers have this on by default with the D-pad. Keyboard players have a section back in the system settings I skipped over. Move cursor through party list and left and right. This allows you to soft target something beyond your main target. Soft targeting will allow you to cast one action with them as your target, before automatically turning you back to your original target. This can be useful for popping a heal on a person quick before going back to DPS spam. Just be wary that even actions that do not have an effect on a target, like a self buff, do remove the soft target. Turning this setting on will just change it to a normal change target. Boring, but if you have no use for soft targeting... Auto target settings is two things. When you have no target and use an action, it will automatically target your closest enemy or the one in line of sight. Line of Sight basically only applies to PvP since enemies in PvE better be in your line of sight. But otherwise you definitely need this on. It's so useful for getting right into the battle the moment you hit an action. Enable Full Auto Target is a further soft target system. When on, if an enemy hits you, they will be automatically soft targeted. Using any action will turn it into a full target. Using this with the previous switch target circle to target select setting will turn it into a full target the moment they hit you. I will be keeping this off. Targeting type? I will heavily suggest going for type 1, ignore depth. When you have nothing targeted, it will prioritize whatever enemy is closest. But then from this target, things get weird. Draw a vertical line from your selected enemy, then apply tab forward and tab backward. Tab forward will then scan to the right until it hits the next enemy within range, regardless of depth or how far away it is. Tab backward will scan to the left. This is consistent, and any complaints of I'm targeting super far away enemies, well you aren't. Cause you can clearly see and hear I cannot target this element. If it's targetable, it's nearby. Time to point the camera better. Cone is the absolute worst option. There are situations where, even though there are enemies on screen, you cannot target any of them. Here's proof. As you can hear, I am mashing as hard as I can, and it's not targeting anything. That's because Cone is a very complex option that has a lot of blind spots. It does have a circle around your character, I think? but otherwise is a series of different cones with the levels of priority. If there is no enemy in cone 1, it moves to cone 2, then cone 3, until it runs out of cones. It doesn't then just pick a random target or revert to ignore depth. It will give nothing. So yeah, stick to ignore depth with newfound knowledge on how it works. Ground targeting settings, gamepad mode, is not only for gamepad mode. Target ring and cursor speed are, but not the other two options. Target ring is how you swap from having ground targeting skills go from being locked to the mouse cursor to being manually movable. R1 plus left stick will let you move it all over the place. And the slider will make it move around faster. Limit ring movement is for everyone. Every ground targeting AoE has a limited range of how far you can place it from yourself. Limit ring movement will prevent it from going too far away and turning purple, non-placeable due to distance. 
This can be extremely helpful for things like Ninja Shikuchi and Blue Mage's Loom. Press action twice to execute is as it says. Rather than needing to click or anything else, just hit the skill button again to place, not just activate the targeting circle. Target display settings is mostly stuff you will probably keep on or want to keep on. Highlight potential targets will give valid targets a yellow highlight when you hover the mouse over them. Display target ring is the ring that appears under selected enemies. You want this on, as it is basically required for properly aiming a lot of things, and also max melee range prodding. Oh, and remember that bit about lock-on and moving into enemies to target-sized donuts? Not all of those have AoE indicators to know it's only under them that's safe. Target lines and aggro lines are the blue and white curved lines you may see appear between players or player to enemy. This is to show you who is targeting what, and is a good indicator to see when enemy aggro has changed hands along with the sound effect that plays. Though, it can be hard to see when in action. I would say keep it on for the sound effect, since that can be important as a tank. Remember back when I mentioned the X keybind for target filters? That comes into play now. Click filter settings activate only when holding that keybind. Enable selection of target nearest to mouse cursor does exactly as it says. Just by holding X, you can select the nearest valid target to your mouse cursor, and a little dot will appear on the target to show you. Then we have the click filter targets. The drop-down menu is not different filters, but different defaults for how your X key will work. So putting it to others will filter out all things that might get in the way of selecting an NPC. Tons of players crowding around the new story quest? Hold the X key with filter to others and players are ignored. Or just make your filter different, and it will become a custom mode. Just note that things are not filtered out, but filtered in. Anything selected on will be clickable while holding the X key, or remember, whatever you changed it to, while those not selected are what is filtered out. I hope that bit blew your mind because it sure did mine, because the filters tab is basically all the same thing. This goes back to soft targeting. D-pad for controller, whatever you keybind it in system for keyboard. First we have enabling target cycling. Now turning this off doesn't actually turn off your soft targeting, it just prevents you from having two of them. The while weapon is sheathed and while weapon is drawn are extensions of the sentence and will enable the filters. Once again, these dropdowns are not different options, but different presets. Proof is on your HP bar. Wondered why they say all and other? That's these. Change all to any other option, hit apply, and your HP bar will also change. If you want something to not be an applicable soft target option using those keybinds, deselect them in the mode you want. Or both. If you want both versions to have the same filter, you can. Just make sure to enable it, or you're gonna be stuck on all regardless. It'll have no text above your HP in the case of having no alternate filters. You can also do more for controller, but they get even more options. L1 plus a face button will change which filter you are on if you enable customization. This is in addition to sheathed and unsheathed for a total of six possible filtering options if you want it. The game even tells you which mode you are in by button press or sheathing, not just what the preset is. But also, do you remember the keybinds set targeting mode in targeting keybinds? That actually means these controller filters. If you want to use these on keyboard, you can. You just need to set a keybind for which ones you want. It will still say the controller inputs like it is doing for me, but what matters is the name of it for what targets you are allowed. Moving on to the next tab is character, which is mostly visual flair. Display headgear, manually adjust visor, and display main and offhand gear when sheathed are the same as the buttons under your character in the character menu. So much the same that these will change with your gear sets changing, because these buttons under your character are saved with gear set saves. Auto sheath weapon when not in battle will cause your character to sheath their weapon after combat ends. This can be useful if you're forgetful and rely on the sheathed weapon soft target filters between battle. Otherwise, it's flavor or something you could just keep off. Idle animation delay is how many seconds until your character goes into an idle pose when you are not moving or have your weapon out. 
Again, just visual flair. Can even have the game randomly choose your idle animation every few seconds, a timer you cannot customize. Look more active even when AFK. Effects while in motion is a lie, but also truth. The in motion they mean is when walking, and they mean it literally as in footprints. This turns on and off footprints in sand and snow or other such areas. Battle effect settings are for skill animations. We have your own actions, party actions, non-party actions, and PvP enemy actions. The only one of these you should ever turn off is others. PvP opponents, you want to be able to see enemy AoE puddles or Bahamut's. Party effects, if you turn those off, you can't see healer bubbles. Big ol' safety bubble that gives you heals and protection doesn't exist under show none. Leave them on limited at worst. You need to be able to see them. Finally, at the final tab, we have mouse, which begins with mouse targeting. You can enable clicking on yourself, or just use the self-target keybind and disable right-click on everything else. If you're prone to accidentally right-clicking things and don't like it, you can turn them off. And enable clicking on field to remove target can be very useful if you rely on the auto-target when no target function like me. When using Dragon Sight on Dragoon, I click my target, click away, and get back to attacking. Super important in my ultimate prog. As a note, this does not count camera panning clicks. A click is defined as both press and release, so panning the camera even a little before letting go is enough to keep your target selected, or not right-click the target in the case of those options. Mouse scroll wheel settings are as they sound, mouse wheel scroll keybinds, but way more limited and doesn't include mouse 3. Our options are camera zoom, cycle enemies like normal, cycling through party list, scrolling through the enmity list, and cycling through aligned players in 24-man raids. If you like using your scroll wheel, here's a way to get a bit more out of it beyond camera zoom. Finally, after all that, we're done with the control settings button. We can move to item settings, which is a single window, but some very useful settings. First, we have inventory settings. Inventory interface has three options. Normal, which is six pages, has four normal pages, a crafting crystal page, and a key items toggle. Expanded, four pages, has two normal pages and two key items pages. The second key items page has crystals appended to it. Finally, open all is the entire main inventory on a single page. Key items and crystals is a single secondary page. Retainers have bigger inventories than players, so they are only allowed normal and expanded options. Normal is six pages, one for crystals, and expanded is three pages, the third page being half and half. Storing items in armory chest or inventory, they are self-explanatory. I prefer to have all new items go to the inventory for sorting reasons. I make sure the first page or two of my inventory is always empty, so if something is in there, it means I have not sorted those items. I know exactly what I have, or have not gone through with just a quick glance. Otherwise, sort them as you wish. Dim effect from unequipable gear is also as it says. Look at your equipment and stuff your current job cannot wear will be dimmed out. Weapons only follow this rule when your level is an issue because of weapon swapping being how you change jobs. Subcommand customization is one of the most forgotten things you could deal with. Every possible command from a right click is in here. It's one big list, but changing the order of things here will also change the order of them in the right-click list. Or you can just entirely turn it off. Don't like a specific option on right-clicks? Turn it off. Or move it into the secondary tier. On right-click, that is the first tier. Putting even one thing into the second tier will add the second tier option in the right-click menu. This is for stuff you still want access to, but not accidentally press at a bad time or, you know, the sort button existing at all. Which brings us to the next section, item sorting. Again, I manually sort my, well, everything. These will affect how the sort command works, and you can turn off specific sorting methods to make it sort in a way you want. Up to its limits, of course. Stack size is about multiple stacks of the same item. Ascending is small stacks first, descending is large stacks first. The latter is better, I would say, 
if just because that's the order inventory gets filled. And if you're mid-gathering a lot of an item, the next stack will begin in descending order regardless of the sort, since sorting only applies at the moment of selection, not a permanent sort. You will need to constantly click the sort button as you collect more stuff. The sort method also does exactly as it says. Rather than filling in order, items will be put into every tab depending on what category it belongs to and your sort methods. With standard category and descending all, we have equipment, consumables, and then miscellaneous. Shop settings are just simple warning confirmations to prevent you from selling certain things by accident. I do want to point out meldable items though. What it means is melded items. Items with materia in them. It won't warn you every time you try to sell an item with materia slots, only if there is materia in it. Moving on to the UI settings button, we have three tabs to go through. First is general. The main menu has two modes. This means the UI element of the main menu, the red buttons. Mouse mode, you can disable the visibility of the UI element. I wouldn't recommend it, but if you prefer a cleaner UI, you could use the main menu button to make it appear temporarily. The start button on controller is how it's accessed there. For keyboards, it's keybinds, system, and target main menu. Once the keybind is pressed, you can click the menu buttons like normal. There's also enable draggable shortcuts. Draggable shortcuts is when you click a button, then click and drag any of the menu options. It gives you a button you can place on your hotbars. Gamepad mode turns off the button element regardless of the other settings. Using start and the menu keybind works for this as well. Then you must use the move cursor keys like we discussed with soft targeting earlier in order to interface with this menu on keyboard. And also the confirm keybind in the same menu. Map settings is weird. First, in your map there are a bunch of settings. A toggle for zooming out, a button to center the map on you if you lost your icon, transparency, icons, and map text. You can also lock it so only the keybind will close it. I will have transparency turned on for the purposes of designated between the map being active and inactive. Shortcut display type is extremely, extremely specific in what it does. When using the map, if you begin to move or click away, it will become inactive. When shortcut display type is on close immediately, pressing the map shortcut, or M in keyboard's case, will close the map. In close when active, M will first make the map active, then a second press will close it unless you make it inactive again. Restore map when not moving is also specific. When you click off the map, it will go inactive. This setting will not have any effect if you click away from the map. While the map is active, start moving and it will become inactive. If you have the setting set to yes, the map will become active again when you stop moving. Very, very specific. Map font size and map transparency are at least obvious in their use. If the map text is too small for your eyes, make it bigger and transparency can be used for some HUD gimmicks or other ideas you might have. Reversing stick is just reversing axis like anything else. Up becomes down and such. Help is a very, very important UI element. I recommend keeping all help text on, but with additional settings to make it not get in the way. Notice my inventory and skill help text both appear to the right, out of the way. Let's set that up, but still go in order. Display item help is obviously item tooltips but it comes with extra functionality. When hovering over an item, you can hit Control, Alt, or Shift, depending on what you choose, to add additional utility. Toggles between no quality and high quality text is to see the difference in crafted items. They have no quality and high quality options. Notice me doing it on these potions. The high quality stuff glows and is a bit stronger. This is important when learning the game just to see how significant a difference high quality is, mostly for gear. If you're wearing no quality gear when there's a high quality option of the same item past level 50, you're making a big mistake. Help text toggling is just a way to manually make the tooltip disappear for a moment when hovering over it. It doesn't really do much, but it can be a nice bonus option. Display action help absolutely needs to be on when learning a job. You need to read your tooltips, please. Turning this option off guarantees you probably won't and will play wrong or get things wrong. 
By default, these tooltips appear next to your cursor. Swap this to Fixed. Fixed will now put all skill tooltips into the same spot. This spot is entirely determined by you and you alone. This is done in the HUD layout, which we'll go over at the end. Fixed Reversed also affects item help. Based on the x-axis, the tooltip may swap to the other side of the screen based on whichever is further away. By default, I have my tooltips in the top right. But if I hover over an icon on the right side of the screen, the tooltip will be flipped to the same position on the left side of the screen. So much better than next to the cursor, isn't it? I'll be using Fixed from now on. Display Active Help Windows. Do you know those green question mark circles that appeared in the middle of the screen when you first started? That's this. And they are important to read because they explain like 90% of the questions I see get asked in places like Novice Network. Display help text when using cross type main commands goes back to the main menu type at the top of this menu. Above the menu is a question mark with a description of what each menu option is. If you turn this off, the description goes with it. Recommendations and play guide are very optional things to keep around, but a newbie may benefit from. Recommendations are recommended tasks the game gives you within an area, or the world or such. It gives you some extra direction beyond the main scenario UI element. That one is more important than recommendations though. Play guide is a quick link to the official Final Fantasy XIV play guide website. This gives you a lot of info on different things you could want, including UI. Though I find the site a bit all over the place and less in depth than someone may want. You can set it up to appear on login or upon every change of area. I kind of turned them off forever ago, so I don't have the experience to say this is how recommendations work in deep depth across a thousand hours of playtime. Displaying achievements nearing completion is another possible recommendation of tasks to do. It will tell you what achievements you are close to completing if applicable. It's accessible through the achievement menu at all times, so this isn't strictly needed. Final thing for this menu is instant portraits. In the character main menu is the adventurer plate and portraits menu. I will not be going over all the workings of these here, but I may make a video on it later. Do you really want this video to be 20 minutes longer? But otherwise you can have portraits appear at the start of a duty and in the commendation window. At the start of a duty, if you close the portraits window, a notice will pop up where you have the notices UI element. It will disappear after 10 seconds and will not appear again after selecting it. But you can always open the duty window to pull up the portraits at will. Moving on to the HUD tab, we have display flying text and the size. Flying text is stuff like damage numbers, healing, buffs, and debuffs. These can be very useful for determining how strong things are or how much healing you're really doing. I recommend keeping these on. Pop-up text is flying text from other players' attacks on enemies and your own damage over time, or dot damage on enemies. Less important than flying text is, but can still be useful info. The next bit of stuff is displaying and hiding different UI elements. Parameter bar is your HP and MP. I do not know why you would ever turn this off, even if you put the party bars in a very visible spot. Display duty list means your quest list UI element. It's just called the duty list. You can hide them during specific moments like duties. This is also where queuing info goes when you're in the duty finder. What specific info you want can be kept while removing the other. Or remove both. But you should probably have something so you can better notice when you're in queue. Display server info is both world info and a clock. You don't need to constantly keep world info on unless you're using the world visit system for any reason. You may forget what server you logged off in, and seeing you're in, say, Siren instead of Midgard Zamor, you know you're not at home. Meanwhile, clock type has three options. If you only have one option enabled, you can usually click the clock to rotate between the three times. However, I have both Aorzean and local time. Aorzean time is how a lot of stuff with gathering spawns. Hunters also use Aorzean time as a pull timer since all players exist within the same time. Server time really serves no purpose unless you really need to know for some reason what GMT time it currently is. Display main scenario guide is very good to keep on. It will remind you always that there is some very important quest you should be doing. Hiding when all quests are complete is a very good middle ground since when you have no quests left, the UI does nothing. 
but when an update happens, it yells that you have more to do. Display character portraits with battle dialogue widget is like... In solo instanced duties in the story, there's always that pop-up text near the top of the screen. A portrait for that character can be seen when this is set on. Unfortunately, I do not have any quick and easy examples to show this. Spoilers are a worry too. But if you see a floating text bubble with a character portrait, there you go. Targets is more toggles with some of it very important. In a higher end rating environment, or in my case for making sure I tell other players when they're missing stuff because I can't help but always be in teaching mode, seeing all detrimental effects on an enemy is very important. Regardless, the leftmost icons will always be your icons, with a slightly green text. But if this isn't enough for you to keep track of your debuffs, you can turn off everyone else's debuffs. Just remember that there will come a time you do want to be able to see this kind of info if you continue to improve. Overhead name display is whether or not you see a player's full name on the target bar. I keep it on initials because it's just common courtesy for someone like me making videos to normally hide names. But you have a few options. Apply display name settings is copying whatever settings your nameplates follow. That's the next red button we'll go over. But essentially, this setting will dynamically follow whatever those settings are, which can mean friends will display their full name while other players might remain initials. Back in keybinds, we saw a keybind for cycling through the enmity list. Display enmity list will turn that UI element on or off like the others from above. Display progress bar will show you cast times of enemies casting abilities. This is actually very useful for keeping track on when untargetable enemies are casting things. Even in the main scenario, there's at least one time where an enemy you cannot target will be casting a spell that you want to know the completion time of. Not shown because spoilers. Display focus target is just turning on and off another UI element. But like the normal HP bar, you can change how a player's name is displayed when targeted by focus target. Which as mentioned before, that's being able to have a secondary target for keeping track of someone. Extremely useful and taking up no space is the display targets remaining HP percentage option. Does exactly as it says and is amazing for making sure you know your current progress point for a fight. Especially in higher end fights, since DPS checks are always there. Moving on to the final tab of the UI settings, we have the party list. Display party list? Yes, always. Especially as a healer or tank. But like, there's uses for the party list no matter what role you are. Hiding party list when solo has no downsides, so feel free to. I do. You have your own HP bar to look at. If you have that off though, keep the party list on for keeping track of your HP and MP. Status effect icon display is the buff and debuff icons that appear next to the party list. You can display from 5 to 10 icons. If you think 10 is far too many, you really underestimate how many buffs there are. Fun fact, in the newest ultimate fight as of this video, players were hitting the buff cap. What's the buff cap? 30. And display remaining time of status effects applies to only the buffs within the party list, not the ones on the enemy bar or your buff and debuff bars. This can be useful if you are extremely attentive to the party list or have a terrible internal clock. I tend to follow an internal clock and muscle memory, so this doesn't do much for me, but it can't hurt to keep on either. Alliance list. This is just more UI displaying. You will want these on for keeping track of the other two parties in 24-man alliance raids. In many of the raids, there's multiple bosses or multiple tasks that require each party to split up. If one of the other parties is dying, it means raises need to be sent over from the other two alliances. And for those without raise capabilities, awareness that someone might get an extra mechanic and needs to sacrifice themselves to prevent your own party from dying too. Party list sorting is an extremely versatile and important setting you can mess with. When playing as any individual role, you can have different sort methods for how your party list will automatically sort in different duties. The role on the left is what role you are currently playing as. When as a healer, do you want your other healer to be right below your name for keeping track of them better? You can swap the sorting to achieve that. Then the button below lets you individually sort every role based on what job every player is. Are you a dance main and want to easily check for who the best initial dance partner in the group is? You can sort your DPS based on how good or bad a pick they are. 
Of course, skill of the player can still make them a bad choice, but going purely off of job choice? Similar for Dragoon and Dragon Sight Partner. My only problem is that role sort settings only have one sort section. You can't have different role sorts based on what role you are. Also, if you mess with it mid-duty or your party list gets jumbled due to a disconnect, you can open the party list and hit the sort party list button to apply these settings instantly or manually sort with the arrow keys. The next red button we have is display name settings. You can customize basically every single possible display name. Those are the name tags over every player's and NPC's heads. Yours, party, alliance, random players, etc. You can even set it to if you want specific players to have floating HP bars over their heads. I would recommend your HP bar and party member HP bars to remain on you if you ever heal. It's an extra way to see at a glance if someone is low on HP. If it's not in the way, it means one extra opportunity. And again, this is the setting that affects the target bar if you use the Follow Nameplate Settings option. Take a bit to customize whose names you want to see or not. HP bars, whether or not you even get full names. But on top of all of this, you can change the colors. Click the heading with the colored dot and you can change the colors to one of 56 different options. Very useful for colorblind players, or just to give yourself a different splash of color. I kept all mine to the defaults though. Either way, take a moment to check every option you have. Including the wrongly named General tab. This could be called the PvP tab since most of these settings are PvP modes. Display name size is a toggle for changing the size of all nameplates, and is the only general setting. CC is Crystalline Conflict and is the smaller 5v5 mode. This is a good reason for it to have its own unique settings. Now, I'm going to skip ahead to the final red button because the next one is a doozy and likely the most important settings. I have a video all for the log settings and how the chat box works. I'll still go over it here but stick solely to the settings listed in these windows. Log window settings is mostly about the spot where you see all the text, not the text entry field. Name display type is how you see all names displayed, including your own. Chat prompt font size is specifically about the text entry field. How big do you want your text to be as you are typing it? Display world name and chat log when player is on another server isn't just about when they are on another server, but from another server. With the cross world visit function, players from other servers can visit and talk like normal. This will place a purple flower with the player's home server next to their name. Not strictly important, but nice to know when someone is a visitor. Lip sync during chat is characters making mouthing movements when you type in chat. With it off, your character will not mouth at you. And obviously, a profanity filter turns all swearing into a bunch of star icons. But also, all profanity filters are flawed and cannot catch everything, and often catch non-swears. Let Momodi say fuck. Weirdly, the next three settings have nothing to do with the chat box. The error messages appear near the top of the screen when you are either too far away from an enemy, unable to face them, or when skills are not ready. The altitude error is for flying. When you reach the world ceiling, it will pester you about it. Weird place for them, but they're there. I would keep them on until you're more experienced as a player and know how to better tell what your issue is. At least the battle errors, not the flight one. Enable log window item linking actually means item tooltips. When you right click an item, you can link it in chat to show friends or other people who may be trying to answer a question. When this is on, hovering over an item in the chat box will give you the tooltip. When it is off, the tooltip will not appear at all. Enable resizing of log window is the little like pyramid arrow in the top right. If your chat window is just right in the size you want it for absolute sure, Turn this off so you don't accidentally move it. Otherwise, remember it is here for changing the size again later. Timestamp settings are something you turn on in the log details. You can have every message come with a timestamp to know when it was sent. So if you go AFK and 10 minutes ago there was a conversation, you know it was 10 minutes ago and whether or not it's a good time to bring it back up. Or if it was people going to do a duty, and 10 minutes ago they probably already went into it. You can have these be GMT or local time, and either a 12-hour or 24-hour format. 
Log text colors is exactly what it says. If you want to change the text color of anything in the log, you can. You're still limited to the same 56 colors, but that's a lot of options with plenty of overlap in what you might use them for. Gathering messages and crafting messages can easily be the same color, or such. Then we have the log filters. We have four logs possible, general, battle, event, and you can add a fourth that you can name yourself after clicking the plus sign on the text box. Then right click the fourth tab to change the name. As for the filters themselves, you can filter in or out every possible different line that goes into the chat box. I recommend keeping general to have the most actual chat channels on at all times. So you can see party chat or such as needed. The battle tab in filters is all about doing damage and taking damage. These I would only ever recommend having in one tab. The event tab is good for that since it's a weirdly named tab. Make that all for battle events and your other tabs just be for everything else you want. For announcements you may want to turn off, I recommend battle system messages as a start. That's stuff like, you killed enemy A, Bob killed enemy C, then NPC dialogue. That can go into the event tab, since you're not going to be talking to NPCs mid-battle. Then there's loot messages, synthesis messages, gathering messages, and periodic recruitment notifications. I keep all these off except for my own loot. I don't need to know when Billy stole all the loot in a dungeon. The fact I got none is enough notice. Synthesis messages, I can visually see when I fail to craft by there not being an item in my inventory. Or, you know, manual crafting and seeing myself fail. Gathering and fishing messages, again, I can see that myself. And periodic recruitment notifications is the party finder. You can turn this off in party finder too. I made a video on that too. But you know those annoying X number of parties meet your search criteria messages? Yeah, that's this. Moving on to the log details tab, it's a nice and short section. Each tab has three settings, the font size of the message box, turning on or off timestamps, and the window transparency. But these work weirdly. Timestamps will apply regardless of what I am about to point out, so that's fine. But if I go to the battle tab and start messing with font and transparency, nothing happens. Font size and transparency only apply if they are click and dragged off the main bar to be separate windows. Any chat boxes attached to the general tab will default their text size and transparency settings to whatever general is set to. But once you pull them apart, the individual settings kick in. Notification sounds is the third tab and the simplest. You can add a sound effect to many different chat types. Do you want to hear audibly when someone sends you a slash tell? Add a sound effect to it. Pretty sure that's even the default. You have 16 sounds to pick from, the same ones from the sound effect text command. Can I get a danger bongo in the chat please? Alright, time for a huge section. Hotbar settings applies majorly for both keyboard and controller players. Let's start with the display settings. Hotbar display settings always, always, always display recast timers. You have two options, a tiny countdown in the corner or a big centered counter. I recommend center because it's way easier to see. Being able to keep track of cooldowns is very important to improving as a player, and using them on cooldown especially for DPS cooldowns. A pie chart isn't enough without a stupidly good internal clock. Hide unassigned slots is up to you. Any hotbar slot without something in it will be invisible, but become visible the moment you click and drag any icon you might put on the bars. Displaying hotbar numbers is only important if you're really forgetful of which hotbars are which, and that hinging upon your playstyle. Like maybe you use hotbar cycling. Hotbar cycling, along with the hotbar cycling buttons, are the keybinds we saw way earlier that let you change the first hotbar into any other hotbar. The number will change as you cycle the hotbar, informing you always what your current hotbar is. So if you use cycling, the numbers are nice. The arrows? Probably never. Only if you are someone who clicks everything will the clickable arrows ever be useful in my eyes. But hey, maybe you can make it work. Pet hotbar only appears as a scholar or summoner, or when on mounts that have special actions. 
When it comes to cycling, only pets from Scala and Summoner will be a big thing for cycling, since there's another option we have for that too. Enable drag and drop repositioning I believe requires the numbers on, but I also recommend never letting this be on. It's way too easy to accidentally move your hotbars around this way, and there's a much better way to adjust your hotbar positions. Then we have a big spreadsheet of buttons in this next section. This will allow you to turn on and off each of the 10, 11 if you count pet, hotbars, and change the layout between one of the six different ways you can lay out 12 icons. With this, you can make hotbar layouts to your heart's content. Make your hotbars in a way wholly unique to you. I even have a miscellaneous bar that has some random stuff and a button for opening and closing three hotbars to display my gear sets. But we'll talk about this even more later. There's more we can do. Pet hotbar display is that better option I mentioned for pet hotbar on mounts. At the bottom is the automatically replace cross hotbar 1 with pet hotbar when mounted. However, that description is a lie. It replaces hotbar 1, not cross hotbar 1 only. Cross hotbar is the controller stuff, yet as you can see, only hotbar 1 is changing. And even then, it seems to break stuff on the crossbar while you are mounted. If I change the settings, crossbar 1 will no longer have the pet actions when mounted. I have to get off and back on. I genuinely can't find a difference between any of these six settings. Mount, pet carbuncle out, auto replace on and off. All the options seem to work exactly the same. My best guess is it relates to pets being changed into the Endwalker era, and the uses of the pet hotbar becoming increasingly fewer. If it still has a use and you actually know what it is, please tell me so I can pin your comment, because I otherwise am leaving this as entirely worthless beyond the replace while mounted option. Anyway, onto settings that do work. The sharing tab is for having hotbars shared not between each other, but between classes and jobs. Any hotbar or crossbar selected as shared will be the same across every class and job you have. If it is not shared, those hotbars will be unique for the class or job. Notice how only the hotbars in the middle of my screen change with everything else staying the same, because those four hotbars are 1, 2, 3, and 10. On to the cross tab, which is all about the cross hotbars. As a keyboard player, you do not need this, but as you've noticed, I use them for extra hotbar space. I always have them displayed too. If you don't, they only show up when using actions as such. Here's me holding R1. Display hotbar help will have bits of text over the bars to tell you what action is which in case you forgot what your icons are. When you're getting used to things, this can be nice to have. When you're a more skilled player, and not seeing much of a use unless you're learning a brand new job like a new expansion gives. Use pet hotbar just does not seem to do anything no matter what settings I try. Again, tell me if I'm missing something. Use pet hotbar for mount actions though will change the current crossbar into the mount actions bar. This is good to keep on as a controller player. It only applies next time you get onto the mount. Enable duty action input is for the duty actions as the game implies. They're special actions that some rare duties have, or are part of Eureka and the Bojian duties. This will allow R3 to be pressed anytime you have actions prepped, when pressing L2 or R2. This is kind of something you need to have. The only other option is putting it on a hotbar slot of its own, which is wasteful if you want to keep it open for other buttons. Display control guide is two things. One, when holding L2 or R2, it will give you what buttons correlate to which spots in the middle of each section. Secondly, at the middle line will be a notice that you can press the pad, or select, which I guess is share now, to enter crossbar editing mode. For some reason, this notice will not appear while mounted, but the buttons for hotbar slots will. Hitting share still brings up the edit menu. Cross hotbar transparency has three different parts you can set. Standard is the crossbar in the default state. Similar to the always display cross hotbar setting, 100 transparency will only have the bars appear if a button is held down. But additionally, we have active set and inactive set. When holding down L2 or R2, whatever set of buttons you have highlighted is the active set. The ones not highlighted are 
inactive. As you can see, as I change which pieces I highlight, things appear and disappear accordingly. I could see a few uses for this for being able to see more of a field when not actively hitting buttons. Personally though, not much recommendation to play around with this. Crosshopper controls are the three options for using L2 and R2 to activate your abilities. Hold requires you to hold down the L2 or R2 button the entire time. Toggle just requires a press. Mixed requires only a press, but if you hold the button down, then when you let go, the buttons will go inactive. The only issue is the WXHB, which we will cover in the Custom tab. Those options, which I highly recommend to use, seem to only be usable in Hold mode. Toggle and Mixed are just actively worse. Before we talk about that though, there's Cross Hotbar Display Type. This is a very weird way of saying how you want the button spread out. The slash in the middle is the line separation of the crossbar itself. Do you want the line to be L2 versus R2? Or do you want the line to be D-pad versus face buttons, with left and right of each side being L2 and R2? I have the control guide on to better show this off. Holding L2 on the first mode has both parts left of the line lit up. In mode 2, L2 activates both sides of the line, but the left section of buttons. This seems way weirder, and you should probably stick with the first type, but personal preference. Before we talk about what this last bit for W cross hotbar display settings, move into the custom tab. At the minimum, turn on WXHB with simultaneous L2 and R2 double tap. What this means is you will gain access to a second set of hotbars when you double tap L2 and R2. So L2 single tap and hold will be 8 buttons, then L2 double tap and hold will be a different set of 8 buttons. Well, that is provided you have the settings like me. On, and enabling D-pad and face buttons. Make L2 be left and R2 be right, and set what hotbar you want it to be. Theoretically, you can just make this be hotbar 2 or 3, with hotbars 1 through 3 all being for battle. As you've seen, I've had it on the entire time. One is just a further extension of quick marker access, the other is my limit break button. One big limit break button whenever I need it. Count them! One... One. Above that though is the expanded controls. As it says, you cannot use this under toggle type, but you can use it for mixed type, unlike the double tap option. When you press and hold one button, then press and hold the other, you can gain access to another 8 hotbar slots. An extra 16 total. In total, with these settings, a controller player has 48 different possible buttons they can use without using any form of hotbar swapping. Make this hotbar 2 or 3, whichever one double tap is not. And bars 1 through 3 are all battle skills available with a quick press. You can usually get by with just 32, but if you need 48 available, here you go. Get learning the muscle memory of these sooner than later, because they are super amazing. But that leads us back into the cross tab and those options we skipped. Always display WXHB? I would say that's a yes, especially depending on what you put on them. If you have any cooldown sitting on them, you want to be able to keep track of those timers. Return to XHB after WXHB import. What that means is double tap L2, press any skill button. The crossbar will change to be highlighting just the single tap L2 section. This has a couple uses like putting two different cooldowns on double tap L2 square and single tap L2 square. You can double tap L2, hit square, then hit square again to use both in a row. I personally don't think I'd do that, but it is an option. Position WXHB separately from XHB. Absolutely yes. This gives you much finer control on your HUD layout. You can always just place them in the same position anyway, but the added options are just better. We shall see in the HUD layout section. WXHB input timer. This I believe is actually centiseconds or hundredths of seconds. So 100 is 1 full second and 25, the default, is 1 fourth of a second. This setting is how fast you need to double tap the button to activate the WXHB. 25 is a pretty good baseline, but if you struggle to make it work, maybe slowly bump it up one step at a time. 
lower, you're probably never going to be able to hit it. Near impossible. Sorry for the back and forth, but given how intertwined these options are, it seemed necessary. To finish up custom, we have set selection. It seems backwards, but ignore the auto switching first, because it only makes sense after we discuss customization for sheathed and unsheathed. This is for making it that cycling hotbars, tapping the R1 button, will only cycle between specific sets. If you have sheathed weapon on and set it to 1 to 4, only hotbars 1 through 4 will appear from repeated taps of the R1 button. Unsheathe your weapon and all 8 hotbars become options again. That is, unless I turn on customization for when weapon is drawn. For example, I have only 5 through 8 available when drawn. And as you can see, tapping R1 over and over, only 5 through 8 gets cycled through. All 8 hotbars remain available in all situations from an R1 hold, so it's not like you're partitioning off entire parts of your hotbar. And a word of warning, there are mechanics in the game that necessitate sheathing your weapon for a time. Extreme Caution and Acceleration Bomb are common mechanics that explode when the player does any action, often even camera movement. Auto attacks count, and sheathing your weapon tends to be the easiest way to achieve turning those off. From there, we have a PvP settings section. It's the exact same stuff, but specifically for the PvP modes, since after all, they have entirely different skills and an entire separate set of hotbars. This way you can have different settings for the much smaller PvP toolkit. And so we move on to the final section, HUD layout. Before going in, to move the whole chat box, you click and drag on the general tab. That is not moved in HUD layout, which is in the system menu. This is how you're going to move basically everything else. I also recommend you have the party list visible from having a pet out or just always visible and plant yourself in front of a striking dummy for more UI options. Remember these shortcuts. Control plus home or the R3 stick for changing size. Shift plus arrow keys for pixel by pixel movement. Changing size we've already mentioned before, but what is this pixel movement? If you want to be a perfectionist with your UI like I am, you can move everything one pixel at a time. For example, click this inventory box element. Shift plus arrow keys slowly shifts it one pixel at a time. Now I'm not sure if it's actually a single pixel, I'm not counting that, but see how much more control you have. Before we start going over different elements, let's go over the central UI, the main piece of HUD layout. You can store up to four different layouts, one to four all being different layouts. The small gear icon to the right of these buttons is a copy function. The top row is what you are choosing to copy, and the bottom row is what you're choosing to copy too. If you come up with a layout you really like and want to use as a base, copy it to all four slots. We also have three toggles for making it easier to sort through everything. System is basically everything that isn't a hotbar. Hotbar is, well, hotbars. And duty seems to only have two things, but it does have more. Duty action is the duty actions we mentioned earlier, where some duties have special abilities. Duty Gauge is usually some form of Enrage Timer. A gauge will appear with a boss charging up some powerful move, or draining a bar they are doing damage to. However, go into the Diadem if you have it. That's part of the Ishgardian Firmament Restoration. In there is the Compressed Ether Gauge. This gauge is a Duty HUD element, but you can only move it when in the Diadem. So if there's ever an element in a new type of duty you can't move, check here. The current UI element has every element that you have filtered in. Next to it is a gear with settings for that element. Every UI element has three settings. Element size with a drop down menu, transparency settings with a bar you can drag, and display element toggle. Though some things disable the element display and transparency. Oh, and remember that fixed tooltips for skills? Action help. Move it around. There you go. Please don't turn these off unless you're like actually super knowledgeable, and read them all. However, there's a number of elements with much more. For example, every hotbar will have the option for shape. I'm going to go over all the extra important settings you can find in here. First, we have the job gauge, which will change based on which job you are. You can toggle every job gauge into a simple mode. Simple across the board tends to be basic progression bars with a dot that can be filled in for different resources. 
Dragoon, for example, looks like a weird backwards axe. We have the bar for Life of the Dragon's timer, and then two sets of dots to fill in First Mind's focus and Gaze of the First Brood. There is no tangible benefit beyond visual clarity, but maybe you don't like fancy gauges. Status info is a huge one because it is so customizable. You can have buffs and debuffs as a single bar, or split into three or four groups. When as a single group, Normal will have buffs to the left and debuffs to the right. Left Justified has three options. One is debuffs to the left, with buffs after. Two is buffs to the left with a small space before debuffs appear right after. And three is the same as two, but debuffs first, then buffs. I recommend none of these and immediately move to three or four groups. When as three groups, we have status enhancements, aka buffs, status enfeeblements, aka debuffs, and other. Other is stuff like free company buffs or anything not a normal buff. When we have four groups, the final group splits enhancements into enhancements and conditional enhancements. Conditional enhancements is any special buff you may randomly obtain in a fight. Dragoon has Dive Ready and Draconian Fire. Both of these count as conditional since there are more to these beyond upping your attack or defense. Whether or not you split conditionals into their own tab is optional, but splitting into three is something I'll always recommend. You can even individually change the setting of each element. Starting with group one, which is our enhancements, we have the usuals. But then we have display settings. Default, prioritize own enhancements, which means all your buffs will always be placed first in line, or make other players' buffs be considered group four or other buffs. Other is usually extremely barren, so it's not the worst option for keeping track of your buffs easier or keeping track of making sure your allies buff you. I recommend at least prioritizing own enhancements so that you can easily see all of your buffs as they are used or appear. And then focus using gamepad has to do with the select button. When hitting select, your cursor will go onto different UI elements. Focus on will allow you to do this for your buffs and debuffs. This can be extremely important for learning new fights. Does this new fight have special new buffs and debuffs? You can see the descriptions by having focus on. Finally, we have a layout. Justified means where the buffs start appearing from the left or right. So left justified, I have buffs all appear to the left, and my debuffs I have right justified. The number by number is number of icons per row, and how many rows. So 20 icons in a single row, 10 icons with 2 rows possible, 7 icons per row with 3 possible rows, or 5 icons with a max of 4 rows. If it isn't obvious how useful this is, let's look again at my bars. I have other buffs entirely off in the corner, where I probably will never look at them. Conditional enhancements I have separated above the other bars so that they are with my job gauges. And then debuffs? Bosses tend to have special debuffs more than special buffs so I have them aligned with my buffs, but they're bigger and off to the right of my hotbars, so they rarely, if ever, cross over each other. So now when I get some super important debuff, there's this giant icon there. Super easy to see, always visible, and makes it all the easier to get back to focusing on the rest of the fight. Finally, we have the target bar. As a default, the target bar is one element, but instead, we can split it into three elements. HP, Progress Bar, and Status. Status is buffs and debuffs. Progress Bar is any attack with a cast time the boss will use. This makes it easier for you to time when you need to dodge something or react to a new mechanic or such. Then again, you can individually place and size the elements as you want. Do you have trouble noticing when a boss is casting something special to react to? Make the cast bar 200% size without needing to make the HP bar and buff bar also 200%. And so here you are. You have the shortcuts for size and pixel movement, all the extra settings pointed out. Now it's up to you to place things how you want. We have crossbar separated into three pieces like discussed earlier, tooltips where you want them, place and size everything you want, and turn off the stuff you never need. Like inventory grid. Or inventory grid. Or gill. I mean, everything else I would recommend keeping on in some form or another. This is my layout, and this is just one of millions of ways you could set yours up. 
I'll remind you, I have that old video about my UI that still extremely applies with very little changes. Some stuff shifted, I have more hotbar space with crossbar adjustments. That's how much it depends on you. I went over the settings, what they do, tried to minimally explain the more technical stuff. Now it is down to you. Set things up how you like them, how they benefit you. I gave suggestions of what you should or shouldn't do, but it still falls to what is best for your playstyle. Please do point out any mistakes I made, or what those damn pet settings are because I still legit have no idea what they do, and everyone I've asked seemed to not be able to see it do anything. Anyway, before I get on a rant, that's just about everything. Here's a few small things to make note of. Party Finder has more specific settings you can look through, but other than basic filtering functions and the player name search, I personally don't see a use for most of it. I also made a video on it anyway. The currency menu has a settings button too. This allows you to make the currency UI element able to display up to five currencies, cycled through by clicking it repeatedly. The teleport menu has an option for automatic usage of teleport tickets. You can set a minimum gill threshold for when a ticket will be spent or one of other settings that make it super nice to set. I set it for 500 gil since... I mean... I mean... There's also apparently some Mahjong settings, but no, I'm not touching that. I don't know Mahjong at all, and I've played all seven good mainline Yakuza games, and the bad one with Ichiban. Slash pet size all small. Thank me later. On the character selection screen, right-clicking your character gives you a bunch of options. You can save your appearance data before Fantasia use, and an important setting is the backup option. This allows you to backup character and client settings to the servers. It is still better to make a local backup, but multiple options is always good. You can also quickly access world and data center visit here. And finally, the launcher. This has a dark mode, will tell you your system settings with the push of a button. The most important thing here though is DirectX 11 support. If you are having issues with crashes or game performance, try turning DX11 off or on if that's somehow the case. I think that's it. Maybe something got missed but there's always the option to just randomly right click stuff. There's always more, always more that gets added. I hope this helped because good god this was a lot to put together. Thank you for watching this behemoth. Like, comment, subscribe, please share this around. I worked hard on it. This script took me a week to complete on its own just because so many settings were poorly worded, wrong, or for controllers which I don't use. And then some settings literally broken? Yeah, no, please. I tend to be much more low-key at this part, but this one hurt. Thanks again, take care, and may the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And special thanks to my patrons over on Patreon, with an extra special thanks going out to Eamon al Khatib, Benjamin Han, Benjamin Rice, Ethan W, Frazier97, Henny G, James Hall, Jeremy Abbott, Jericho, Kevin Lowe, Mizella, Shimmering Blaze, T Rogue, Timmy, and Zero Two. Enjoy your new settings, and see you for the next one.